So hello everyone, thanks for tuning in. Um, this month Eco Resolution is exploring our relationship with nature or the natural world and how the psychological separation between our lives and the world around us might lie at the heart of many of the crises that we're facing today. And really excited because today I'm joined by Pat McCabe, who's one of the most inspiring individuals I know. Um, Pat is of the Diné Nation. She's a mother, a writer, an artist, activist, a speaker, and a cultural connector who brings a very deep and profound message around the understanding of indigenous ways of knowing and being to the discussion and inquiry on sustainability or how we live and act in the world. So Pat, welcome. Oh, I'm so happy to be <clears throat> a part of your uh, platform here and Always love the work that you do. You two are some of the most inspiring people I know. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in the same ball game, but yeah. <laughs> no, we look up to you, Pat, as one of our real teachers um, and have so much respect for all the work that you've done over the years. And in the short time that we've known you since the last perhaps four or five years, um, just having had the opportunity to be in your company and to learn um, has had a really deep impact into how we see the world and how we relate to the world. So with this topic of, um, and how we see ourselves within that as well, I think is kind of key. So in this topic of relationships, it just felt that your voice was the most important voice to us to hear from. Um, and there's a term that you use often, which is right relationship. Um, and particularly, I was curious to hear you speak about r right relationship in, um, in relationship to the thriving life paradigm that I also hear you speak about sometimes. And I'd love you to just touch on this idea of relationships um, and the role of how we relate in the building out of a, th of a paradigm that supports a thriving life. Okay. <clears throat> well, in the spirit of right relations, I also want to introduce myself um, the way that we do. Uh, so I, my mom named me Patricia McCabe, and um, I come from the Diné Nation. People know us incorrectly as Navajo, but we call ourselves Diné. And so in that way, I'll say, uh, and so I'm telling you about our, my clans, and we get our clans from our mothers. And these clans also refer to uh, specific places on the earth. And they also uh, refer to um, uh, historical events sometimes. Um, and so they're really kind of a map, a relational map. And so if you're from my people, when I say that, you know, all these uh, connections are made and we, we might be uh, relatives. In fact, I just am making a new relative out on the, on our, uh, in our homeland, Dineta. And uh, we met on Facebook and um, he's, uh, I always see him, you know, helping out the elders. And so we've been getting uh, financial donations to him to get to our people. Um, the COVID crisis is, is hitting our nation really, really hard because of the, uh, partly because of the rural lifestyle in some ways, although the really rural people are doing just fine. It's the, it's the semi-rural people that are suffering. But anyway, he, um, because we're clan, you know, we're, we're really excited about working together. So that's uh, uh a part of this relationship that you're talking about, actually, for my people. And then I was adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life. And um, and so in that way, I was given the name Wiyakpa Najimwi, Wiyakpa Najimwi. And that translates roughly to something like womaning, standing, shining. Um, and so <laughs> so I uh, I try to live that name to the very best of my ability. And, you know, when you were, when you were speaking, um, I, I, right before we before I uh, connected with you here, I was singing some songs and I just want to sing a, a little bit of a song, um, which is calling out to the mother earth and, and asking um, her to inform what needs to be said here. But also it's a way of, of, of deep relationship with her to sing to her. And uh, 
So anyway, this is a, a kind of a call for for guidance and help and letting her know that um, th that we need help and that there's a little bit of suffering going on. And we're asking for, for her nurturing and her medicine and her relief. So uh, let's see if I can, now that I said that, let's see if I can pull it up here. Um. <clears throat> oh, shee makaina. Hey, oh, yeah, why, So I uh, will take a moment with that, I guess, so uh, here. Um, you know, I've been, uh, as many of us have, been on a lot of Zoom calls lately. <laughs> and I've been weeping a lot on the Zoom calls. Um, I actually went through a pretty deep uh, illness in the last few months and just coming out. So it was kind of like having a near-death experience, even though at least consciously I didn't feel like I was near death, but I just came out with just that super open, tender heart. And so every Zoom call I'm on, I'm weeping. And I've been telling people, you know, maybe what we can do um, is one, you know, it's okay to cry in front of each other, even in these meetings, because our whole understanding of life has just been, you know, overturned. And um, and so I've been saying, you know, maybe uh, we can make a practice of collecting those tears on a tissue and um and then when the meeting is over go out and and offer them to the earth because those tears like the tears i'm feeling right now are are saying so much more than any words any thoughts they're beyond all of that they're like the truest um expression that we that we can have in a way and so i think by offering her those tears um you know, then she can really know us. <laughs> she can really know what's in our hearts, our our hopes, our fears, our disappointments, um, what we need, uh, our joy, our love. Because a lot of my tears right now are a lot about the love and connection I feel with everything that has been heightened because of this uh, illness that I had, but also the the way this illness is traveling among us. And so I feel like the song is similar that way. You know, the song, to offer her a song is, it's, um, you know, the words are the same every time, but, but the feeling I'm having and the breath that, and the, and the quality of the breath that I'm offering each time is really, it's very similar to that expression of the tear. It's so, it's beyond words. It's beyond thought. And, um, and so those songs are so, so powerful in making relationship. And I guess as I think about English songs or other songs, I, I don't really know if we if we make songs like that, but maybe that's something we could try to do is make some songs that are really for her and reaching out to her, really directed to her um, as a child to a mother. So as I was singing that song, um, I sang two rounds because sometimes we sing four for the four directions. But I, so, sometimes I only sing two, and I sing that in recognition of being um, a woman. And my my journey, well, really, it's all humans have this interior journey, an interior world. And then um, the way that we express it or, or witness it outside of us. Um, but But for me as a woman, I also feel like I have this role of walking on the earth, so that's actually the full name of my people is they call us humans, her holy earth surface walkers. So I am that as the female, but I also have this capacity to go down into the earth. <laughs> and <clears throat> I learned that um, in, uh, in, in a prayer way, um, 
during the time of my menstruations. So I didn't, I didn't have any idea I was going to talk about that at all. <laughs> but, um, but that's, that's the power of the song because the song tells me, you know, what's really important to say right now. So, so that journey for the woman, um, you know, I'd say my earth, my earth walk time is during my time when I'm not menstruating. And then my, my interior earth going within the earth is during the time that I'm menstruating. And so if I can take that time, if I can take time to pause, and just acknowledge that there's something really uh, different and deep happening, or that is possible to happen between the female and uh, the menstruating female and the Mother Earth. Um, we say that uh, that is a time when uh, the women can receive direct instruction from the Mother Earth about how to be here. How you know she she can tell us what's coming. She can tell us. Um, what, what would be good for us to gather? She can tell us, um, she can just tell us so many things. She can tell us how to pray even. And, um, and, and, and she can give us practical information, but she can also give us ceremonial information. And this is, um, maybe a difficult thing. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a difficult mental construct to, to go from modern world paradigm into this, place that I'm describing here, uh, this place of the song, this place of this relationship, this place of this inquiry. Um, but honestly, um, I've, every woman I've ever worked with who I've, I've created a space for her to acknowledge that time of her life or her month, um, and just made it a quiet place for her and told her that it's possible for you to receive this instruction. And, and if you were to go to sleep right now, with with that intention that you could receive dreams for us and and you could help the people and the community with these dreams you know so um so this is a, a very profound relationship that humanity has through the woman um to help us to understand um our place and how to be here um you know it's uh I hope that I have said that in a gentle enough way to to not raise alarms for people because I'm talking about what what well, one I'm using the word woman <laughs> whatever we mean by that anymore but I'm talking about someone who menstruates right and um and so uh and I know that there are women women who identify as the female of our kind but they they for whatever reasons they they're not menstruating anymore so I don't I I know that I'm aware of that and I and I have tenderness for those for those among us that way but for those of us who are in that position, um, you know, I just present that to you as a possibility for, for you to help us as a whole, men, elders, uh, children, um, any, all of us, uh, to understand and to make connection to this Mother Earth. Right now, I really feel like, um, we, we are having to, to answer for ourselves as a, as a species, as an entire species, <laughs> like the, the mother, every, so, uh, you know, you've heard me maybe give this teaching um, about the, the sacred hoop of life. And so every, every single um, form of life, and actually for us, that includes stones and mountains and other things that maybe people don't think of as being alive. They are though, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, they, uh, so every, every part of this construct of earth gets to have a seat on this sacred hoop. And us five fingered ones, you know, we get to, we also have been given the honor of having a, a spot on this hoop. And so each member of this sacred hoop of life, uh, has been given a, a perfect design in order to help contribute to life thriving. And we have been too. The question is, do we remember what that design is? And, and are we enacting it? And I'm going to say that, you know, from what I know about myself and, and watching us and watching current circumstances, I'm going to say, no, I don't think we are aware of what our perfect design is for thriving life. And I don't think that we're enacting it. Um, <clears throat> and so that's been a big inquiry for me. But, um, but what I want to get to is to say that so, you know, the, the whales have to enact their perfect design for thriving life. The crickets have to enact their perfect design for thriving life. And so when every being is doing that, then this fantastic symphony of 
vitality and life occurs here. And so we're kind of witnessing that as we have withdrawn, right, from from our, our usual activities. We're watching all this life thrive. Uh, you know, like kangaroos are bouncing down the street in Sydney. All of a sudden, um, we've got mountain lions uh, showing up all over the place. I keep seeing all these posts. A friend of mine just posted about one in, in where I live. Um, so all the, all this nature is coming around. People are talking about the way the birds are just, you know, just singing their hearts out everywhere. Um, and so we're kind of witnessing um, <clears throat> them in being able to fully enact their thriving life design. And, they're, and it seems really joyful. And so, so for us, you know, I don't, I feel like we're just, uh, we're, we're kind of defined on this hoop as a species. We're one lump species. <laughs> and I don't think the thriving life hoop gets to, you know, cares, you know, whether you're um, black, red, yellow, white, male, female, um, rich, poor, you know, all these many, 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 many distinctions we make amongst ourselves. And and as we sit here pointing the finger over there, it's those guys over there that are the ones that are messing up and they point right back at us. No, those guys over there are too liberal and whatever, you know, and, uh, and so we're going off that way. But ultimately, um, the hoop only sees us as a species and so we're, we're, our contribution to that sacred hoop of life is the sum total of our actions, of all the actions. They all add up to either contributing to this thriving life paradigm or, or not. And, um, and so that's something that is um, really coming home to me right now. <clears throat> and it's creating some really radical ideas for me. <laughs> Um, and you know, we, we were with bio not too long ago. Right. And, uh, and bio, uh, bio is exploring this as well, but, you know, just kind of asking, um, what, uh, well, one question is what is there beyond social justice is I think one of his questions. Right. And I've been having a similar, similar sense and saying to myself, you know, I'd be willing to forgo all my justice as a, as a woman, as a female on the planet, and I'm do so much justice for that. <laughs> and I'd be willing to forego my justice as a brown person, and I'm do so much justice for that. I'd be willing to forego my justice as a indigenous person, and specifically a Diné woman. We just had our anniversary of when the first um, first uh, several thousand of my people were marched to a concentration camp in the southern part of the state, and. Many of us died, and anyway, it was complete upheaval for our people as part of the attempted genocide in our our part of the world. But I would forgo the justice for that um, if it meant that we could all now collectively turn to this Mother Earth and ask her, what is it that you need from us now? Like, I think that has to be the biggest question <laughs> beyond any other, any other anything. And so I... Um, so I'm I'm exploring that, and and I'm also uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause after this one and see what you'd like to say too. But um, uh, but I I've been a part of a group, and um, we had this gathering, and I just felt like there it was very Eurocentric. It was very modern world paradigm versus thriving life paradigm, or I might say indigenous worldview paradigm, and. Um, I just found myself being, um, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, that's the norm, right? Like everywhere I go, that's my reality. And so I don't usually get too annoyed by it, but I got really annoyed by it. And, um, and so I, I, I brought it up and I said, you know, does it, does it, so we're aiming to take this leap as a species. And in that group, we're specifically talking about economics and wealth, the transformation of wealth. And so we're, we're ready to make this leap, let's say. So is it mandatory for all of us to understand what all the human beings have been up to? Like, can it, is, can we make this leap if, you know, this whole group of people never has any concept that human beings have lived on this planet for thousands of years with outside of capitalism, <laughs> outside of singing to the earth? outside of making offerings, you know, is it mandatory that we all understand who each other is before we can make this leap? Or can we just make this leap anyway? 
You know, so this is a, a very big question for me right now in terms of our relationship with Earth and our potential to be um, a part of generating thriving life here. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, Pat. Um, it meant such a lot to hear you talk just then and to hear you speak. Um, and there was lots of things that um, it sparked many things. Uh, one of the main things was when you were talking about stopping and asking what Mother Earth needs. Um, and that's something that's so opposite to the way that this current system is working, um, which is so fueled by um, kind of continue, con continuous need to grow and a desire to grow and kind of a very linear projection, um, which is kind of a strange mixture of desire and fear. It's like, we can't stop <laughs> because what will happen? Um, and it's, and so it's this, I, I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's greed so much of its desire and, f and fear and this weird way that it gets mixed together with certain ideals that we might think of as positive, like terms like freedom and um, happiness, but they, they, they're they almost one-sided in the way that they're delivered and exclude every other way of being and knowing. And, and, I, and I loved what you were saying about just stopping and asking um, and it reminded me of how many um, faiths are based on this understanding that before you receive teaching, or particularly in many traditional faiths, when you would become a monk or a nun or, or something similar, you had to first of all really need and ask. And um, many stories would say of many trials that the person would have to go on to prove how much they wanted um, the knowledge and, and to be, and to be, to, to really ask for, for help. Um, and, and then it also brought up this idea of, of what you were talking about remembering, um, and how in the system it's, it's almost like many people and myself included at times have just felt so cut off from a deeper way of understanding the world and, and, and our place in it. Um, and it's almost like it feels impossible to connect in a deep way to that other way. Um, and, and yeah, so I would just love you to talk a bit about, um, this forgetting and if it feels like you really can't connect to something deeper when you talk about the female menstruation many women are taking contraceptive pills and are cut off from their natural cycles um for example and the system and the ways that many people live is very very cut off from any deep relationship to a natural world beyond a park or seeing the sky which then is often framed by buildings. Um, and, and, and then when it comes to indigenous knowledge, um, it's this concept of an ancient knowing that's implicit within all humans as everybody at one point being indigenous to something in some place. But then at the same time, it's very specific to people who are still living in that way. Um, so it feels at one time very localized and place-based and culturally and cultural. Um, and then at the other time, very expansive and all inclusive. Um, <clears throat> and so I'd love you to talk a bit about like how we can connect to this deeper knowledge when it feels like we might be so far from that place. Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
I think I want to start by addressing what you were talking about, you know, this this going, 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 and, and, and a lot of fear about what happens if we, we, we can't stop. It's more, better, bigger, faster, more, better, bigger, faster. <laughs> and um, so I, I feel like it's important to say right now that uh, for myself, I've been living for decades with the knowledge that we, we were going to get stopped one way or another, whether it was climate change or, I don't know, some kind of uh, large uh, earth catastrophe, um, weather, or, you know, I just, I just knew that we, there was no way for us to keep going. And so I find this virus absolute genius, personally. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean I think it's happy, but it is just genius in terms of the way it has stopped us. It's not affecting any other life forms. It's just us that are being called out to, to think, to pause, and to really have to, I mean, we were not willing, we were just not willing to change very much, no matter what data or information or anything we were presented with. We just were like, I got to keep doing this, I got to keep doing it just the way I'm doing it. And that's, that's part of the nature of the paradigm that we were in, um, which says that, you know, uh, in order to have what you need, you have to beat out somebody else to get it. And that means you're in this extreme competition. And that means you have to keep going. So like if, if you get a day off, um, you don't take the day off, you work on the day off, because maybe that's going to put you a little further ahead than the person who decided to take the day off, right? So it's just kind of endless that way. Um, and I'm going to say that this is the beginning of our being stopped. If we don't get completely stopped with this one, it's just going to keep coming. It's just going to keep coming We're we're not going back. In my, in my, my feeling, my belief, I don't think we're going to go back to what we knew before. So on the one hand, that's pretty disconcerting, even terrifying, perhaps. Um, and, but on the other hand, <laughs> it creates hopefully a lot of opening for us to reconsider who we are, where we are, how it is. And, um, so I know that for me in my work, uh, suddenly, I mean, I feel like there have been people listening to what I've been doing and saying, and there's been a lot of curiosity about it, but it hasn't really had like, like it was still kind of like a recreational possibility <laughs> or something. And so now it's, it's, I notice it's kind of landing in a slightly different place because, um, yeah, because it's, it's talking about a way of being human on the earth other than the one that has been dominant and running over roughshod over every other way, as you, as you point out, you know, so, um, and so I just invite us to make a practice of cultivating curiosity, cultivating um, uh, a little bit of excitement about possibility, you know, as, as I've been saying, part of my practice is to wake up in the morning and say, I wonder what amazing thing is going to happen today. So even in this circumstance, you know, what happens when you say that, even if you're not totally feeling it and you got to kind of say it with that enthusiasm, I wonder what amazing thing is going to happen today. So I make myself say it just like that, even when I wake up going, oh, my God, this day, you know, or whatever. And uh, and 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 it opens a doorway. It sends a signal to our whole body um, to be ready for that. It's a, it's a command, actually, to our body. And our body says, OK, right, something amazing today. And um, and you'd be surprised <laughs> how much comes by doing just that practice, because we're we're not operating in a vacuum. And that's been a great part of our illusion is to think that each individual is operating in a vacuum. You know, we have your own bank account, you got your own credit card, you got your own ID. It's very separate from anybody else's you don't want you want to make sure nobody else gets a hold of it. Um, that's how separate you are. Um, and, and the truth is, we're like these energetic uh, generators and creators uh, of reality. And I've really been experiencing that a lot. Um, 
in this illness because, uh, I mean, my, I had this terrible dry, deep cough. I didn't have any other symptoms and I did get tested and I tested negative. We don't really even know if that is relevant, but, uh, I don't think I had the thing, but, um, but anyway, it was just been really, really difficult. And, um, and so I, I, I prayed one day and I asked, um, so this is part of my practice as I, I, sometimes I write and I ask, um, a question. And then I go ahead and, and, and respond as though I am higher intelligence, as though I am the larger community of life of that whole sacred hoop, as though I am, um, some of the spirit helpers that I know, the, the corn mothers, the white buffalo calf woman, the changing woman, um, the archangel Michael, um, these beings that, that we, that we know, that we have heard have been around us. And actually lately, even, uh, Emmanuel, the Christ. Um, <clears throat> and I write to myself as though I am them. I would say that a lot of times they really are writing through me. But even if we're just, again, it's like a command to the body to, to access the very highest possibility of, of understanding and, con and conception to come through. So when I asked, you know, what do I need to know about this illness, this cough? Um, and how am I going to heal it? What do I need to do? And what I was told was, was that my heart was, was grieving its neglect so deep that, that it was affecting my heart, <clears throat> excuse me, my lungs. And so I was told that I had to, that if I wanted to heal my lungs, I had to humbly go to my heart and with sincerity and willingness and really inquire about what, how have I been neglecting you? What is it that you really need? What is it that you or have been longing for? Or, or what is it that you need to express that I haven't been willing to hear or receive? And, um, and so, uh, one of the things that, that it, that it said was, um, you know, because I've been traveling, traveling, traveling faster, bigger, better, more faster, all that stuff. I've been just zooming around the world. And, uh, and so all of a sudden I'm stopped and, and I realized that in some ways, you know, I'm always, I'm always meeting with crowds of people, but I'm rarely having intimacy, um, with other humans. It's, and, and it's often just one direction. So I'm giving the output. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's not really satisfying that really deep human need for intimacy and relationship. And so I had to address my isolation. And I also found that as soon as I um, also had to do some grieving work, and when I did those things, when I changed the old story, um, my whole view changed about how what's what's going on around me. So all this stuff had to have been there the whole time, but I couldn't see it because of my story. So when I changed my story about thinking that I was connecting with all these people and realizing, but wait, you don't ever have any intimacy. <laughs> I'm around people all the time, but I don't have intimacy. And, and I got to have that. And then also doing some healing work around um, stuff that took place in my childhood. Now I'm an adult. Now I have a spiritual path. Now I can go back and retell that story to my very young person and give her understanding. Because she, she, she made up a story trying to make sense of it all. And it was a, a pretty wacky story because she just didn't have enough understanding or or pieces to, to really get to any truth about it. So when I retold that story, um, everything began to change. And even though I'm just sitting in a room with in my mother's house in, in the most urban part of New Mexico, my least favorite part of New Mexico, things began to find me through my email, through other connections. I mean, it was just, it's just been the craziest, most amazing, wonderful thing that as soon as I change my interior – everything around me changes. So, um, I mean, I wasn't like, I wasn't, sometimes I post essays on Facebook about what I'm processing, but I didn't do any of that. And yet everything began to meet me here in this little bedroom in my mother's house in New Mexico. So that tells me about the power of our connection um, and how important that story that we're holding inside is, how that dominates how that dominates our, not only our reality, but exterior reality and how that reality responds to us. So maybe that doesn't sound like an answer to 
<clears throat> your question about the earth, but in a way it is because if we if we retell the story for ourselves about who we are to the earth and who the earth is to us, um, everything is going to change. Everything yeah, no, I change. think that's the most perfect answer, Pat. <laughs> um, and I love how you got to that place from beginning with curiosity. Um, and because curiosity is so much about perception and it's taking on like an openness and a sense of childlike, um, openness and eagerness to discover and to learn. Um, in a way that the system that currently isn't serving doesn't want to learn. It wants to only learn what it fits into its own current box. It doesn't want to think about new things that doesn't, don't fit in the box. Um, and that, that idea of curiosity, I love how it often has to, you have to turn your back for a moment on everything you think you understand and you know to then like have true curiosity. Um, and it's an openness to the unknown and the unexpected and something you, you're, that, that might be completely opposite and, and completely new. And it's like, um, I love what Sharon Blackie, her book, um, The Reenchanted Life. And she calls the, how we've fallen out of love with our world and it's clear from the way we treat it. Um, and one of the key things is, how we can reignite enchantment in our lives and through how we can, um, how that can help us to fall back in love. And it's this, this, this whole idea of curiosity. Um, and, and then coming back to this idea of the stories that we tell ourselves, um, to make sense of the world and what we're finding out in our explorations. Um, and I love how, storytelling is such um a shared thing across all of humanity as always told stories through imagination to make sense of the current and present and past and it's this like sense making and of discovery um and the kind of the way the two kind of go forwards and backwards between each other because one is like opening out and one is making sense but they're not they're they're kind of circular um so so I love that about about storytelling and it also made me think about the need to tell a new story is often said it said like we need to find a new story that can help us in the times we're in but in a way it's how can our new story be an old story um and 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 what can we learn from the past to help us now for the future? Um, yeah. And, and the role of the storytelling in strengthening a movement as well. Um, because if the stories that we're telling ourselves now aren't serving, how can the stories that we co-create, um, take us where we need to go? Um, and, and I feel like the standing rock, protests had a really big influence on this strong story that is being used a lot now that's uniting people across cultural differences across the world um and 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 that's been a really amazing thing and I'd love you to maybe talk about the role of kind of protest or maybe that's the wrong word but of kind of everybody coming together around a strong story um, and and the role that that might play in coming together. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I want to say a little bit about story, um, and that is that David Abram, I don't know, you might know the author, he's a naturalist writer, David Abram, and he, oh, he says that words are spells. <laughs> and, um, and, they, and they are, they're very powerful. Uh, they, they create reality. So, you know, I know many people are exploring that, that idea about, um, what, how, what words we choose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. And that's very important. Um, so I agree that Standing Rock, um, to me, Standing Rock broke through so many paradigms. It just busted down walls of, of all kinds about who could be allies 
about, um, it revealed a lot about what was taking place in our government and, and how things, how security, how National Guard, how military was being used, um, to, to uphold corporate interests. Um, if we didn't really know that before, we got a good look at that there. Um, like really for real, they'll, they'll come down with a gun and, <laughs> and make you comply to the corporate wish. Um, <clears throat> and so that was a very big breakthrough for, for humanity. I agree. Um, I've been thinking, uh, a lot, and I think I said it at one of your gatherings first publicly, um, where I was saying that, you know, I, I really do feel like as activists, um, we, we have to, we have to simultaneously prepare for war and peace, <laughs> you know, and I don't know if Einstein really said it, that all the bumper stickers attribute it to him that you cannot simultaneously prepare for war and peace. And yet that is exactly what we are being, have been asked to do, I think, because because we have been drawing a line in the sand and saying we will not give our consent to X, Y, or Z because for, for all these great reasons, you know, it's killing us. It's, uh, it's harming animals. It's harming water. It's, um, and so we will not give our consent here. And so in that sense, that's the war, right? It's not some, it's not, I don't necessarily see it as having to be an aggressive thing, but it's, it's, it's a, it's creating an opposing force, right? And so we've had to figure out what to do to be able to find, we're looking for the the key points to apply that opposing force. We're looking for how to sustain ourselves in that. I think that was the conversation we were having that day when I was at your gathering in London. And, um, uh, and so that's, we've had a lot of strategy around how to do that. But now here we are in this moment, you know, and, um, and I said at that time, you know, but we also have to have the heart to to be able to have the softness and flexibility to, on the one hand, be like this. And then in the next moment, when all of this opposing force suddenly crumbles before some kind of a truth, which I think is happening right now with this pandemic. All of a sudden, it's like, well, wait a second, you know, certainly here in the United States, it's like, you mean the United States government isn't going to financially support its people? They're going to keep pouring trillions of dollars every day into petroleum companies? And, you know, so so there's a lot of uh, dissonance going on <laughs> in my country and probably other countries as well in different ways about what's really going on. And so all of a sudden, there's willingness. That's what I was really feeling like is a willingness would sweep the land that we have not seen before. And so we have to, um, that's a strong statement, but we have to um, be prepared to receive this willingness. If we're wise, I'll say, we will be also prepared to receive this willingness. As people begin to see, wait a minute, this isn't really working. Wait a minute, this maybe this has never been working. Wait a minute. Um, now I, where I get my clean water is really important because I don't know if that water is going to keep coming out of the tap. Well, what's happening with the lakes? What's happening with the streams? What's happening coming off the mountains? You know, those questions are going to arise here fairly soon, I think. And, um, and also the food, you know, in the United States, our food system is, is breaking down right now. There's, uh, my friend was telling me that up where she is up in, uh, um, Minnesota, they are the the pig farmers they're they're slaughtering like 20,000 pigs a week right now because they there's nowhere for them to go and they can't feed them and the meat processing plants all had to be shut down because of the virus that was spreading in those places farmers are dumping their crops dairy farmers are just letting their milk run down the drain um i mean it's it's ludicrous uh because obviously if we had a system that was built to serve people um, you know, or we had a government that was interested in that, they would be saying, Hey, wait a minute, let's get the train, put this stuff on the train and we'll just distribute it far and wide because people are out of work and they're not getting paychecks and they're going to need food and, you know, but none of that's happening. Right. And so, so suddenly we're, we're being brought face to face with, with, with these illusions and, and deficiencies. And so this willingness is, is, is sweeping the land out of necessity. <clears throat> and it's a hard awakening. So I would like to see our story change from us and them 
to 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 having that kind of versatility to to flip now <laughs> and be the welcomers and be the comforters of the people that once told us we were nuts <laughs> and extremists and etc and i think that that's really important and and interestingly during my illness i and also doing this trauma work um about some things that took place when I was very young, um, some very harsh, cruel uh, treatments that I could never make sense of. And so I made up all kinds of terrible stories. Uh, you know, I, 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 I told myself, well, you must have been doing something. There must be something so grotesque about you that you, that this is the treatment that you got. And I think really collectively in this world, we could say that there must be something I'm doing. There must be something so wrong with me that the whole system um, is treating me this, you know, this cruelly and this without, without mercy, financially, um, body image wise. I mean, just every which way, right? So, so maybe this metaphor really does extend out to everybody. But, but the thing, the one thing that came to me, um, <clears throat> which was kind of surprising to me, because of the history of the church with indigenous peoples. But, but, you know, I, I, uh, when I was a little kid, I, I, um, was presented with Jesus and uh, I was told that Jesus was this supernatural being that could help me. And so I clung to that as a, as a little kid. And, um, and then when I got older and I, and, and I went more into my indigenous ceremonies, I wanted to pretend that that never happened because the church did these terrible things to indigenous peoples. But the truth was the spirit of, of the Christ um, is still alive for me. And so recently that, that spirit of the Christ came to me and talked to me about the resurrection as I am trying to resurrect some part of myself into a new story. And that resurrection was all about saying uh, you know, because uh, because Jesus told me uh, the resurrection didn't happen when they crucified me and put me in the tomb, and then they came and the, and the tomb, the stone was rolled away from the tomb, and I had risen from the grave. Students, um, excuse me, Jesus said the the resurrection took place when they stuck the sword in my side and I forgave them. That was the resurrection. And then in this recent healing, um, the Christ came back to me and elaborated on that and said. Nobody, no matter how crazy they get, no matter what happens out there, and they went crazy on him, right? Is the story. Um, no one can can tell you that you give up your life, but you. No one can do that, and so you you have to decide for yourself what you are going to allow to snuff out your spirit to snuff out that Holy Spirit within, to snuff out that sacred fire that was placed inside of each and every one of us. And, and so if you can hold fast to that place, you're going to resurrect from every situation. <laughs> and so the idea was for me, you know, you're going to resurrect from these terrible stories that you've been operating under for all this time. And so I think that's true for us. We have that ability to, to resurrect ourselves from these terrible stories that we've been living under. And we have the ability to, from that, be able to have this compassion for each other. Um, and, 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 and instead of being so quick to point a finger and say, see, you were wrong. See, now, now what do you say? You know, and, and all, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to actually begin to try to align with um, compassion at this point mm. yeah and humility I think comes out of forgiveness and compassion is the sense of humility um, and I feel perhaps our species as a whole needs humility a lot well not the whole but a lot of people well a lot of us need humility um in order to make the changes that are needed. And, um, yeah. But what is the relationship, do you think, between anger and forgiveness or anger and compassion? So if, do you see, do you think that 
anger plays a role or that it's important to overcome anger through compassion and, and forgiveness? Oh, I think anger plays a huge role in the process. And in fact, that's been a part of my process. And that was the part, the one part that I really did not want to do. Uh, and that's what the holdup has been for 56 years for me. <laughs> that's a long time for it to be held up, right? And to suffer from it. But the, but the thing I did not want to do is I did not want to feel the anger. I did not want to. So, so that, so for me, the steps of the healing is to, to fully let in the full truth of what took place. And that in itself is very difficult. So again, I'm thinking about a specific person, but we can extrapolate this to our situation globally to fully let in what the, the, the acts of violation that have occurred. And then to feel all the feelings and not censor any of it, not censor any of the feelings that arise when we really realize what has been done, what has taken place. So I had to scream and grieve and cry and yell and, and, um, and, and every time that feeling of shame and fear and confusion, because that's how it shows up for me comes over me I t and, and I have the space to do this now that I'm in quarantine right so I go and I and I find a space by myself and I start working with allowing that to be expressed and and for me the reason that the Christ showed up was I had to create a, a space that had for me uh, helpers that were powerful enough to hold all of these enormous emotions I was having Someone who could hold the whole business for me. And so, you know, I like to think that that would be the blue corn mother or the white buffalo calf woman or like an indigenous presence. But for my little kids, no, what they look to is Jesus because <laughs> that's who they were presented with. I mean, it's, it's a little weird and shocking to me, but I'm like, all right, whatever you guys need. We'll do it. So to call the Christ in and because, because I always saw those posters on the wall when I was in, you know, Sunday school of Jesus having all the little kids on his lap. I'm like, Jesus knows that the kids are supposed to come first. None of these adults around me know that, but he knows. And also my little kids trusted him because they were like, and this guy knows about suffering. I mean, if anybody knows about suffering, this guy, he knows about suffering. He knows about being ostracized. He knows about being misunderstood. And he also knows how to transcend it. So, yeah, I'm going to hang out with him. So once I brought him in, then I had a container to help hold all of this emotion. Now, um, for me, that's a private process. That's not something I'm going to take out onto. I mean, I have been. It's been going willy-nilly because I haven't been willing to just do it with myself. But now I'm going to do it with myself. Now I'm going to really clean out that wound and, and allow it to express all the goop and goo it has to express. And once I do that, now it's like, it's like I say, the vista is completely different. The whole landscape has changed entirely. And in terms of what I see and, and the options that are available to me that just weren't there before. And so that's what I think could be very exciting about this time for us collectively is again, you know, once we change that story of who we are, we're, we're not the whole hoop of life. We're one part of the hoop of life. Where are we? Well, we're actually set down in, a, in an abundant paradise. I say it's the Mother Earth's economy is fearless generosity and radical abundance. Um, every fruit that you pick, because I'm paying attention now and I'm saving those seeds because I got to be able to plant these seeds. Every fruit or every vegetable, you know, you open it up and there's like a hundred seeds in there. I mean, that's her way. She's just, you know prolific. And so all of this scarcity, I mean, as I look at world events, and I'm thinking, you know, okay, so if all these people are unemployed, and they can't pay their mortgages, and let's say uh, the bank's really going to kick out these people from their houses by the tens of thousands, as economy is breaking down. Um, I think they're going to try it first. But at what point do we realize that all of the problems can be taken care of if we remove money from the equation. <laughs> 
Like there actually is everything we need here to live. But because of this construct of you can't have it until you do X, Y, or Z, or give me X, Y, and Z, um, that's the part that's going to be killing us. And, uh, and, uh, and how far are we going to be willing to go into that place before we can accept, well, maybe life is the most important thing. Maybe as many of us as can pull through this thing is what's important. And maybe we're going to just have to let money uh, step aside here. And maybe for a long time, maybe it's just going to be an entirely new, new thing. You know, I know there are some landlords and such that are saying, you know what, you don't have to pay your rent right now. I mean, not everybody's doing that, right? But there are instances where people are already coming to that conclusion. They're like, it doesn't make sense for me to try to wring this money out of this person when the whole thing is, you know, is in chaos and 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 difficulty. So, um, so where we are is actually a place that is totally designed to support <laughs> our life. And how it is, how is it? How it is for me is that... <sighs> You know, my, when I start losing my compass in figuring out, well, what's supposed to happen when this happens? You know, I start like seeing the dominoes going and then I'm starting to try to figure out what my strategy is. I can't get too far down that road because there are too many variables for one thing. But, but I just start saying to myself, well, the one thing I know is that, is that I can't go wrong presenting myself to the Mother Earth, presenting myself to that holy star above presenting myself to all these birds singing wildly around me, uh, presenting myself even to the other humans if they care to, to watch, and and uphold the honor of being human being who was given this amazing opportunity to walk on this Mother Earth and to live here and to have this heart that feels so much and weeps at the sight of people on my computer screen and um, et cetera, you know, like that to me is a part of upholding the honor of being human being. And I've even gone so far as to say, you know, maybe now is a good time for me to create the most exquisite death song. So this is the song that either you're given or you create um, to sing at the time of your dying. And it's your final offering. It's your final expression to creator, to this Mother Earth who has sustained you your whole life. It hasn't been the grocery stores and the banks and the people. It's been the Mother Earth. <laughs> and to be able to 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 give her this final offering. So so it's in this, even though it sounds kind of radical, maybe this death song is the greatest offering and affirmation of this gift that I've been given to be here of, of any of it. So I'm thinking about that now. I'm thinking I'm I'm going to make my death song now. And that might be the story that actually ends up giving me life till I'm 100 years old, but <laughs> but I'll be ready to do something honorable and beautiful as my lasting last and maybe lasting imprint of being here. Mm. Yeah, I love what you're saying about celebrating the humanness and celebrating the life and the abundance of life and everything Mother Earth can give and that we can hopefully give too and the reciprocal relationships um, that can bring us in. And... Um, yeah, you've been speaking a lot about song making and singing. Um, and it reminded me what you said at the beginning, like, uh, I think you said something about if England had, uh, songs, like ancient songs. And it made me think about all those ancient, um, songs that people have always sung about their connection to land like in Spain there's the Cante Hondo which was like an old song that they would sing in like pre-flamenco tradition which was like the song of the earth and it was this deep grief sadness often um but also yeah and then and then it's and emerged into the flamenco singing tradition or like in Ireland this like ancient songs which have traveled through oral history about um 
human relationship with the more than human or the other than human. Um, and, and, and I love this idea of these practices that can bring you into a deeper relationship, um, with something. Um, and so I don't know what the beeping is. Um, <laughs> but, just, <laughs> but yeah, these practices of song, um, and I wonder if you have any other practices or ways of relating that you would recommend trying out if somebody hasn't tried them out before. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, um, you know, one thing I've been talking about is, is the great mystery. We have this concept of the great mystery in the Lakota way. And it's the unknowable um, for us humans. And that's not something that's around in modern world paradigm. <laughs> we don't think that there's anything that we can't know. And to me, that's problematic. But um, just just because of our physicality, there's some some limitations in some ways, it seems like. But anyway, um, and so we have this concept of the great mystery. And, and we have practices that lead us right to that place. So that place is when you come to the end of your own resource. Um, we have a ceremony in which we dance for four days without food and water in the sun. And um, it's not humanly possible to do this ceremony. You, you literally, you cannot do it. And so there comes a moment in it always where you come to the end of yourself. You come to the end of your will. You come to the end of all the physical stamina you've tried to build up. And, um, and then what ends up carrying you actually is your prayer, your spirit, and your song. And then with that, you're met by the spiritual world. And the spiritual world will kind of pick you up at that point and sort of carry you to the completion. And um, so what a thing to have a human practice of, of bringing yourself purposefully to that place, you know. It's so powerful. I mean, I, the more I think about it, the more genius it appears to me. And and so what I've been saying is, you know, when when you get to the end of your own resource, you fall against the mystery door. And sometimes that mystery door swings open. And when that happens, um, all these possibilities get revealed to you. And they allow you to live your life um, in a powerful way. Powerful, not powerful over others, but powerful in, in your ability to be in even deeper relationship with this place that we're in with with the, all of our animal relatives, with all of our human relatives too, and all of the spirit spiritual beings. Um, and sometimes it allows you to bring solutions to things that are taking place in community, right? And so um, I feel like we're at that place collectively right now. We're, we're falling against a mystery door. And so I just want to, to say to us that, that there are humans who cultivate that place. Modern world says... You're always supposed to be in control. And if you ever come to the end of your own resource, it's because you didn't plan well enough or you were undisciplined in some way. Well, hopefully by now we can see that this whole system has, has been said, uh, set up in such a way that it's been almost impossible for you to be able to, to meet the criteria to have food, clothing, and shelter. It's been very, very difficult for, for the vast majority of us. And it has nothing to do, again, with what the resources that are available. It's how they're being held or distributed and such. So it, it's not that we that we have failed. Um, it's that we have been giving our consent in some way to a system that, that has not allowed us really to be the child of this Mother Earth, that has interfered with what this Mother Earth would give her child to live. And to me, that's a very deep violation of spiritual law to interfere with what the mother earth would give to her child to live no one must enter no one must get in that in that relationship that's 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 wrong <laughs> and and yet it's been so prevalent in our construction so so one i just want us to maybe have a little bit more ease in this unknown and mystery that it's it's okay to be in that place and so for me you know the practice of, of meeting that mystery with, again, with honor, with grace, 
with um, courage um, and willingness is to go out and make offerings in the morning. I mean, that's that's the way is to go out and face that rising sun. Ideally, you know, as soon as that 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 round, beautiful star disc comes up above the horizon, you know, you're there to greet it. In our in our in my cultures, I have two cultures. In Dene way, we offer white cornmeal in the morning, and then if you want to offer it in the evening, you offer yellow cornmeal in at sunset. And in Lakota way, we offer tobacco. So for me, I start out to the east in the morning, and I make an offering. I address all the medicine and holy beings and things I don't even know, but that which serves life, light, and love to the east. And then I turn to the south, and then I turn to the west, and then I turn to the north. And I make those offerings and I offer the ones above and I offer that down to the earth. And then I offer at the center and the Holy one within. So I'm doing seven directions. And I just let them know what's on my mind. I let them know what I'm concerned about. I let them know what I'm working on. I thank them for things. We've been getting some rain all of a sudden. Rain almost, rain's been having a very hard time getting over to where my mom lives for a long time. And now the rain has been coming. And so I'm addressing those things. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for those people that I, that I see on the news. And I'm wondering how they're doing. I have dear friends in Africa who are getting flooded out right now. And, um, you know, so I express those concerns. And in the last few days that I've been doing this, every single time the, the, the wind comes up to meet my words. It's, I, there's like, like the whole earth is responding <laughs> to these, <coughs> excuse me, to these prayers. <coughs> uh oh. The whole earth is responding to these prayers. It's just, it's just phenomenal. It's almost like nobody's been praying in my mom's little suburban neighborhood for so long that the earth can't even believe I'm doing it. And they're just like, oh my gosh, you know, and um, so, you know, this is a gesture that human beings have been doing for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. It's a gesture that is recognized by the sacred hoop, by the winds, by the sun, by the water. And so, you know, I just encourage you to give that a try and to speak, speak your questions. And, and then... And then I would add, you know, I'm, I'm opening myself to be willing to receive the answer. Show me, you know, make that place in me to be able to really have a conversation with you. Whatever is blocking me in my mind, whatever is blocking me in my heart, as I'm standing out here hoping the neighbors don't see me and I'm a little bit ashamed and embarrassed about what I'm doing, you know, help me to, to not let that be a deterrent for us to have this conversation. You know, like you just got to get as real as you can with it and and express yourself to that which serves life, light, and love and just see what happens. If you do this practice every day for 30 days, the whole the whole thing changes completely. It's complete you elevate this out of the human realm. You know, it's that thing you we cannot create we cannot solve a problem from the same place that it was created. So we have to elevate ourselves out of the human paradigm because we've been, we've been misled and we've been trampled on and by our own kind. And so let's seek that larger community and, and for once ask for their input, which is the earth community, the star community, the spiritual community. Mm -hmm. So would you call that a practice of prayer or would it be something else? I feel like it's the making of right relations. So in other words, if someone is like not a prayer person, <laughs> I don't think it, I don't think it has to exclude you. It's, it's because there is clearly a whole community going on around us with sky and earth and trees and water, birds, everybody. And we say that, you know, the human beings were the last to arrive here on Earth. And that means that everybody else around us is our elder. And they're all doing their very best to teach us how to be here. But just like, you know, those uppity kids in, in the school classroom that always want to know better than the teacher, that's kind of how we've been. But what happens if we open up to these elders who 
live their impeccable lives in their thriving life design with such ease and grace and beauty? What happens if we inquire from them, how do I live my life impeccably with ease and grace and beauty? I'm open to hearing from you. Mm. And do you have an elder in particular that you like to talk to? Or is it all... Well, <clears throat> I, um, I've been addressing the eagles a lot lately, and I've been addressing the water a lot lately, and I've actually been addressing the thunder beings a lot lately. Mm. Uh, yeah. Mm. Thank you so much, Pat. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's a an amazing um, opportunity to hear you speak um, about right relations and how we might come into a better way of relating. Um, and everything you've spoken about today, um, how we can come to a place of community through curiosity um, and openness and um, what, what else did we talk about? Forgiveness. Um, resurrection. Resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> resurrection from false stories. Elders. Um, yeah, we've spoken about so much. Um and just the abundance of Mother Earth and the knowing that that's all we need. And just in that simple realization, just the deep, it's not, it's not hope. Hope's the wrong word. It's just the sudden realization that everything's perfect, just like that. Um, and that all we can do is come from that place and not worry about the outcome because as long as we're coming from that place and we're accepting that and we're doing everything for that, then it'll all be hopefully perfect too. <laughs> but More shall be revealed and we will be in alignment with the greater plan that's been going on all around us that we've been swimming upstream against and, and pretending didn't matter or wasn't there, but it's, it's the plan. I, I keep saying, you know, all false authorities will bow to the authority of the mother earth because Everything we get, everything that we have that we need comes from her. And there's a certain order in which all that takes place. So her authority is the final authority. So for us to align with her, um, we're at least moving, moving with the current, the current of thriving life. Mm. Thank you, Pat. 